Um, well, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be back. Um, by my watch, it's uh, 12.35. I promise to be finished by 1 o'clock so that um, I'm sure there's lunch to be served at 1 o'clock. Last year, I talked about social media generally. Um, this year, I've moved the topic on to deal with content. So can I just have a quick show of hands in the room? How many of you have ever had to pour over a newsletter, a brochure, a website, any content in your firm? So just hands up. How many of you are responsible for content? OK, so it's a live issue. Um, so I've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm not going to go into all the detail on the slides. I hope that you go away with some real um, key points that you can implement in your own firms. So um, what is content? In the old days, we'd probably think about it as a brochure, a newsletter. If you were fortunate enough, you might be able to afford radio or TV advertising. The thing about content, though, for me, is that it was held by a few people. Now, we have entered a new epoch. And I'm absolutely convinced that what is available to you, whether you're a sole practitioner or whether you're part of a much larger firm, certainly levels the playing field for all law firms. And so you'll hear a lot about comp competition and competitive threats, but content is the one key differentiator for all of your firms. Anybody in the room know who Seth Godin is? I may have mentioned him before. There's one person with their hand up at the back. You probably don't know this uh, manifesto. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, change this. It's a free manifesto which you can download, which is taken from his book, The Icarus Deception. That's how I'd like you all to think. Think of yourself as artists, not as consummate networkers, not necessarily as business developers. Think of yourself as artists, OK? I'm an ex-lawyer. I know how difficult that is to engage the right brain, but that's what content requires, OK? OK, anybody know Valorem Law in the US? They get lots of, they get lots of press over here. They're the firm that uh, came up with the catchphrase, pay us what you think we're worth. OK, they're mentioned quite a lot. Got some great uh, infographics on their site. But look here, look what's on their site. This is the bottom of the first page. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and blogs. OK, that's just the first page. I can't remember how many blogs they've got. Condé Nast, OK, a publisher. Fast Company. Anybody read anything from Fast Company? Yeah, OK. Uh, look at the right-hand corner. This is not a law firm, but look at the corner. Get Social, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, Flickr, Vimeo, Pinterest. You're already losing. I'm already losing you, I suspect, OK? These are all publishing platforms. OK, anybody know Mish Gondorea in the room? A few of you, OK? London law firm, been very innovative in this area. You'll see in the top left-hand corner, this is on their knowledge page, knowledge is the most important currency in business today. I wouldn't disagree with it. What I would say is how you package that knowledge. This is their TV channel. This is a video, Matthew Slotover. I think they, they supported a prize. This is a video that was done on their TV channel. How many of you in this room have thought of having a TV channel for your firm? Okay, none of you. You could do it, one of you, okay? You could do it today, all right? McKinsey, iPhone app, okay? PA Consulting, they have a Pinterest page. PA Consulting, a Pinterest page, that did surprise me. Clifford Chance, their own YouTube channel for graduate recruitment. McKinsey's again, their call to action is a video in the middle, but look, on the right-hand side, they've got this ability to share it across multiple networks, Tumblr, StumbleUpon, and so on, OK? Any of you know what that is? It says it's the conversation prison. Does any of you, have any of you ever seen that before? OK, this is Brian Solis's work, who works now for Ultimata. OK, this is a, uh, hopefully you can study it in more detail if you see it on a slide, but there is a network or a platform or a tool that you can be using for your firm right now, and the majority of these are still free. I don't mean free in the context of your investment of time, but this, think about it, is your content publishing world. It's frightening, OK? It is absolutely frightening. In the old days, you could rely on the post, or telex, or fax, OK? You've got many, many more opportunities. Buyer personas. OK, buyer persona is 
Who the hell are you trying to attract as a client? Who are you writing for? When you write your content, do you actually have a buyer persona worked out? Okay? I, last year, I mentioned the words demographic, psychographic, and technographic. Okay? You need to understand all of those three when you come to create content. If all you're doing is producing case reports, you are unlikely to tick any of those boxes. You need to understand who you're writing for. If you read anything that you like to read or view it online, and it's a paid or subscription model, I can guarantee you that the person who's the editor-in-chief has their psychographic, demographic, and possibly technographic worked out. OK? So as this slide says, before you t decide to, to have any content on your website, your newsletter, do you know who you're writing for? And more importantly, once they've read it, do you know what you want them to do? Hands up in this room, who knows what a call to action is? Anybody? OK, does somebody want to shout out what a call to action is? Go on. What's a call to action? Extracting cash. <coughs> That's one call to action, yeah? You're unlikely going to get it from somebody viewing your website unless you've got an online form or something to complete. What, other, what else might be a call to action? What's the most obvious one? Phone the phone number. How many of you have got phone numbers that are accessible if somebody goes to your website on their mobile phone? OK, because a lot of your websites are non-adaptive, meaning it takes me ages to find your telephone number. So when we talk about content, it might be absolutely micro detail, but that is what I think about when I think of content. How the hell do I get hold of you? Think like a publisher. I've said hello there, OK? But think of things that you like. Ask yourself, why are you still buying that magazine or still buying that newspaper or still subscribing to them? What is it you like about it? Because you can work out an awful lot from the things you like that your clients might actually like. OK? Stop producing dull content. How many of you send out client questionnaires or something after you've finished a piece of work for some feedback from your clients? Anybody do that? Yeah, it's a good thing to do. How many of you ask for feedback on your content? No? Why not? Don't you want some feedback on what you've just written? Because I know working in a law firm, it takes a very long time to get content out of lawyers because the work comes first. Content is way down the priority list. But if you're producing it and you're sweating the detail, I'd want to know from my clients how good they thought it was, how interesting it was. Dare I say, was it remarkable? I'm not having a go at Sullivan and Cromwell or Wheel or Veal Gottschall as they were, I think. But in terms of content, I'm struggling to see where their content is. On the left-hand side, I can see something. News items, newsletters. Make it easy for people. If you've got some content, make it easy. Show it to them. Write with passion. How many of you have actually written something and you've loved it? You've absolutely loved the piece that you've written? A few of you. Great. I wish there was some more passion in it, because it's all about storytelling. And I don't know about you, but I can't get passionate about reporting on a case or a decision that happened in a court. I mean, it might be interesting in terms of fact-specific detail, but it's not quite the same as saying how you might have helped a client, whether it's an individual or a corporate, subject to the issues of confidentiality and all that. But you have to have some passion. Dare I say, you have to have some guts. OK? It comes through in the writing. I mean, the, the people that you like to read, whether it's fiction or non-fiction, you don't pick it up because it's dull. OK? Even if you go on holiday and you're taking a book with you, I hope you don't just read the page and think, oh, what on earth is that, all that about? You might do. Think of things like, if you're writing for clients, practical tips. These don't all have to be in writing. They could be in other media, by the way. Guidelines real-life experiences. How about getting some real video content from your existing clients? Telling stories. When you get together and you're having your marketing meeting next time, or whatever you describe it as, what are some great stories that you can share? What are they? That's what you've got to think about, I think, not just case reports. 
okay? Stop being verbose. I do a lot of content work now, and the first thing that I do is I take the last paragraph of whatever I'm given, given and I put it at the top. And that's it. That's all I need to do very often because the lawyer will tell me everything at the end that I should have put at the beginning. I can probably cut out the rest of it, all right? But being verbose doesn't just apply to your content. It also means the content on your websites. Some of it is so long. Most websites I look at have about 1,500 pages. Here's a few examples of sites I like. All right? Nothing to do with law. I think I probably know what he does. He's an industrial designer in India. OK? Design company. These are all simple ideas. But this is how I'd like to see your content thought about in simple, minimalistic terms. OK? Let the words speak for themselves or the content speak for themselves. Just to wind back the clock in terms of newsletters, what I'm seeing increasingly with firms is that they've been doing email marketing for a few years and their open rates have dropped through the floor. Everybody presses the delete button. So if you send it on a Sunday night thinking you're going to be clever and get your email first thing in the Monday inbox, it's going to get deleted. All right? It is going to get deleted. The smart people are actually selling it on a Saturday now, I think. But if you're thinking about how you might get your client's attention, one thing you might do is spend a bit of money on creating a really valuable piece, dare I say, of artwork. Something that when the client gets it in the post, they actually feel special for once. Not that they're being email marketed along with 2,000 or 3,000 other clients. So we can think retro here. But all I'd say is think design, think art. Blogs. How many of the firms in this room have a blog, either a blog that a lawyer runs or the whole firm runs it? How many? OK. So for the rest of you, in terms of not having a blog, I will still say that it's the main differentiator in the content space. OK. This is Jordan Furlong and Steve Matthews from STEM, OK, based in Canada. That's a quote from their latest book on content marketing, and I don't disagree in the slightest from that. OK, there's, there's a blog, the China Law Blog, the Whistleblower Law Blog, OK? You need to have the ingenuity to think, where can I position a blog where there aren't millions of other blogs, by the way, OK? So don't go and look at your competitor, which is what most law firms do, and think I can copy their blog. <laughs> think how you can create your own blog that's innovative and different, OK? There's just a few reasons why I think you should be having a blog, OK? Raising your brand, raising awareness, right? Think of Valorem Law at the beginning. They have three different blogs now, I think, OK? You don't have content marketing strategies generally in law firms. What you tend to have is everybody doing their own thing, OK? One of the key things, I think, for all of you is to make the best use of your resources. If there's only one person who's got any time, make sure that he or she knows what they're expected to do, OK? There's a, bit of, there's a bit of stuff in there about search engine optimization. I'm not going to spend any time on that, OK? Just quickly, multimedia. Uh, SlideShare, YouTube, and SoundCloud, OK? SoundCloud. Anybody started yet to use SoundCloud for podcasts or audio? OK, it's free, OK? It's a very good platform. So if you're thinking of the iPod generation, downloads, listening to your legal update, Try SoundCloud, OK? I talked about it last year. Um, I think it's still a very worthwhile platform. Not enough people are using it, OK? Vimeo, anybody uploaded any video to Vimeo as opposed to YouTube? OK, really stable platform. It's a great platform, not used enough, all right? SlideShare, you'll find more legal stuff on SlideShare than, than probably the other two platforms. Anybody use SlideShare? So anybody do presentations or talks? where they're presenting information at all, which isn't client sensitive. Again, put it on SlideShare. It's another search platform. OK, you can see that it fits on an iPad, Windows, iPhone, Android, as all these things do. So, OK. And the $64,000 question is, is it going to make me money? Is it going to make me money? The answer is, yes, it will. But you've got an awful long way to go yet before you can actually start measuring it because you've got no historical data to say, well, that content did work and that content didn't work. 
Unfortunately, in the content area at the moment, the best content that you've got is probably on your website, a bit on the newsletter, but up till now, most firms have never managed their content in a way that they can understand if it's made them any money in the past. Ask the classic question, is your advertising paying its way if you're still advertising? Most firms don't know. So when you think of things on your website, whether it's a blog or anything else, you have to think of ways of capturing the data, whether it's a contact sheet, email sign up, telephone calls, matter opening. Okay, these are the sorts of things I'd be thinking about to measure my success. Don't forget quality, all right? Quality is still important. It's not just something you produce and put through the photocopy and then wonder why the printing's a bit out of sync, all right? Okay, just a quick thing on syndication. When I say syndication, I mean, how do you share your content, all right? Most firms create a piece of content. Let's say you have a piece of blog content and you leave it on your blog. And then when I look at your search engine figures, your Google Analytics, three people have read it. Well, that isn't going to translate to new client wins. But how about if you'd shared it on Twitter, on Google Plus, and on LinkedIn? You might just have increased your chances of that piece of content being read. So make sure whoever's in charge of creating it also knows that as well as posting it, they have to do something else with it. Otherwise, it's just going to sit on your website. OK? And my advice is a little can go a long way. Don't think, if you're running a blog, for instance, that you've got a blog every day. If you write something that's really, really good, that piece of content will go a long way. Not just because you can share it, but people will keep coming back to it and keep talking about it. OK? And I've talked about this before. I've taken the hub and spoke model. Think of your website in the middle, and on the outside of that are all the various platforms. So what you're asking people to do when you think about calls to action, if they go to Twitter, they're going to click on a link, and that link will take them back to the website. If they go to LinkedIn and read the link, the link will take them back to the website. So when you look at your websites, and I'd encourage everyone in the room to do so when you get back to your offices, ask yourself, is it clear what I want people to do? Because if it's not, and I would say at least 50% of you I would struggle with, then you need to do something about it. The most obvious one is to make sure the telephone number is very clear, the contact details are very clear, or if there's a, there's a page there for them to do something, okay, make sure it's very clear and very obvious. Okay, this is inbound marketing, which you probably know anyway, okay? It's an amplifier. That's all social media is, okay? And that's all it is ever going to be. Okay, so quick shopping list for you all. So this is your takeaway, all right? I've been following the conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is IR events. Okay, I'm not sure how many people are tweeting in the room today, all right? But if you want to tweet, great. But that's what we're talking about in terms of platforms, okay? We're talking about using things like Twitter. So how many firms in the room now have a Twitter feed? OK, so the, the other firms, you don't use Twitter then? No? OK. Um, I think Twitter is, as you've all heard, they, they tweeted about their IPO, their flotation. Everybody heard that news? Yeah? Valuation is somewhat less than Facebook. So I think we can assume Twitter's not going to go out of business, hopefully. All right? LinkedIn. How many of you either have individual profiles on LinkedIn or a company page? Aha! Aha, at least 90% then, OK? So LinkedIn, how many of you are sharing your content that you've created on LinkedIn currently? OK, that's about 40%. So the rest of you, if you've got an individual profile or a company page and your firm is creating content online, then you should be sharing it. So if you've even got 50 connections on LinkedIn, you should share that content. Otherwise, what are you doing? OK, I blogged today on LinkedIn, and I made this point about people who have simply created an online CV and done nothing else with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is your CRM system, your client relationship management system, and it's still free. It's still free. OK? I'm not going to go through all this. This is just an example. This is Microsoft's company page. You can see at the top they have 1.224 million followers. If you've got a company page 
one of the objects that I would have from a return on investment is to make sure that I increased my follower number month on month. Because what they're doing is they're sharing product updates mainly, which people are then commenting and sharing to their own networks on. So if you're stuck at 50 people, one of the objects that I would have if I was running that part of the firm is to increase the numbers. It's a very powerful tool. Okay, you can think about things like this also for LinkedIn, so corporate social responsibility, careers, client wins, and the like. Okay, not going to spend any time on that. Facebook. How many of you have a firm Facebook page yet? Okay, so that's about 35%, something like that. Facebook is still in the legal space, not something that's taken hold. Most people fear it. The way, way I've seen it working really, really well is to engage your community. In other words, allowing your staff to use the Facebook page to post up things that they've done. It may be a charity event. It may be something that they've done that they're proud about. I wouldn't dismiss Facebook. So if you're a locally based firm, OK, Facebook does have its place. I'm not saying it doesn't come with risks, all right? There are all sorts of issues with staff who've gone and said things on Facebook, I'm sure. But I'm talking about you as a firm. Google Plus, how many people have a page on Google Plus? OK, that's about 3%. All right. Google Plus, I would have ignored probably in the last 12 months if it wasn't for the fact that it's now making a difference to your search engine position. In other words, your Google position through the thing, the plus one-ing, which is the same as a Facebook-like or a LinkedIn-like. So if none of you have yet created a Google Plus page, which means you have to have a Google account, which again is free, my strong suggestion is you do have one. So if your clients are coming to you locally, a Google Plus page is good for that because it links with Google Places. All right? So I do recommend that you look at it. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. This is Cadbury in the UK. They're one of the biggest Google Plus followers. You can see they've got 3.398 million. If you like chocolate, they're great to follow. <laughs> OK? It doesn't stop here. The International Referral Group have been posting videos on Vine. Anybody use Vine here? One, two, one hand. OK. Vine is a great little tool for short video clips. My personal favorite is Instagram. Anybody use Instagram for photos? OK. If you're at an event, Instagram now allows you to do a 15-second video. OK, so if you're doing a networking event, you can share that video, a talk that you're doing, possibly, to your social media networks. I really like it. OK. And you saw earlier where I showed you Blick. They've got a Flickr page. Flickr is very similar, but it doesn't enable them to do 15-second videos. OK. And SoundCloud, I've mentioned. All right. Just quickly, because we've got three minutes left. OK, measurement. How do you measure all this stuff? OK, don't spread yourself too thinly. I mentioned at last year's talk, the five platform rule. It still applies. Website one, blog two, then you've got three. Twitter, LinkedIn, and one other. OK, those are my five, all right? When you start thinking about your traffic to your website, I can say this to you reasonably confidently, that if you embrace some of this content marketing and you use your website as the hub, you should see an increase in traffic of between 10 and 30%. So if you're converting a number of your clients from your website, and more and more firms are seeing that now, particularly in private practice, then more traffic should, in theory, equal more client wins. OK, and I've put a few things up here in terms of what else you might want to measure, media interviews, new client wins, e-letters, webinars and so on, OK? Just quickly, cultural issues, all right? Seth Godin, OK, that's a blog I've nicked it from. All right, I hope Seth doesn't mind. That's the hierarchy of success. Most firms start down at the bottom, execution, all they want to do is more stuff. Try and change the attitude of people, OK? Even if it's not your thing, in other words, all this stuff is not really of interest to you, there will be lots of people in the firm whose thing it is, and they want to embrace it. And you've got to find a way of tapping into that. So that's the hierarchy of success. Attitude, approach, strategy, goals, in that order, OK? You don't really need to go into huge amounts of detail with a social media strategy, because if you get your content right, the rest of it is easy. The billable hour, OK, always gets talked about, OK? 
Clients' interests will always come first. But I can tell you this, when I first entered this space in 2010, the firms that were investing in this were about 40 million sterling turnover. In other words, they were recruiting somebody full time to do this stuff. I can tell you now the turnover is coming down and down and down. So sterling, about 10 million now, you are finding firms that are investing in a social media person. They could be an ex-journalist, an ex-PR person, but they're investing in people to do all this stuff, which should remove some of the, not responsibility, but some of the investment of, of your own time. That's not to say you shouldn't be writing content, but you've got to think how you can properly resource it. And if you're less than 10 million pounds sterling, okay, then you still have to think, what's the minimum that I can get away with? And I would say if you're blogging, you've got to be blogging at least once every two weeks. Okay, practical steps. Talk about it. Talk about it. When you go to a meeting, I go to many, many business development meetings, social media is the last thing on the agenda. Put it at the top of the agenda. Rather than talk about work in progress, billable hours, put it at the top of the agenda. Say, we're only going to have five minutes on this, we'll deal with it, okay? Because otherwise, what happens is it gets left to the next meeting and the next meeting. It never really gets done. Now, you might not think it's of strategic importance to your firm because cash flow is more important, managing the people is more important, I accept all that, but don't leave it as a last thing. Okay, top tips, okay? I think I'm gonna finish at one. Have a plan. If you have a plan at the moment, and most firms do have a plan, even if it's for the next 90 days, include content marketing. Have an action, a call to action that says, we're going to produce a blog. We don't have a blog at the moment, but we're gonna create one. Have a style guide. Make sure that if you do start creating content, that people don't create their own stuff and it all looks different in the firm. Reward success, okay? Just putting your arm around somebody and saying, thank you for producing the third piece of content for the third month in a row is quite good sometimes, rather than just expecting people to do it, okay? Remember the long tail of marketing. I'm not gonna go into it in great detail, but in other words, those words that people might search for on Google or Bing, or another social media network for your bit of law, whether it's franchising, branding, whatever it might be, think of using some of those words. That's the search engine point, okay? Don't be afraid to outsource it. In other words, don't be afraid to call on somebody to help you, okay? Invest in a few platforms, not many, many platforms, okay? And open up the whole firm. As I say, start talking about it. And the last point is have some fun. Because frankly, if it's not fun, as I always say, it's not worth doing. And if it all feels just a complete waste of time, then maybe you're not the right person to be doing it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Two minutes past. <laughs>